Thank you for being here, everybody, guys. Uh, my name is Mike McNamara. I'm the uh, festival director and co-founder of the Midwest Independent Film Festival. Uh, a lot of new faces here tonight. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here uh, for the first Chicago screening of Liberal Arts. I saw this film out at Sundance, and then I saw it again in Dallas. It's a great film, uh, wonderful performances. If you are an Allison Janney, Josh Radner, Elizabeth Olsen, or Richard Jenkins fan, you will be very happy uh, throughout this film. They're all really, really good in it. But uh, as you guys know that have been coming here for a while, we are jam-packed every first Tuesday of the month. So, uh, and especially when we have to give away all complimentary tickets, uh, when IFC tells us that's what we gotta do. So, doors open at six, the film's at 7.30. So we try to fill up that time so that if you get here at six, you've got some cool stuff to do. You can hang out with our sponsors, you can grab a beverage, uh, which all, uh, benefits the film festival, but we also have something cool in the theater. Some months it'll be a, a camera demonstration from Canon, maybe a screenplay reading. Most months it's our producers panel, and that's when we take a couple of filmmakers or producers, and we just kind of have some relaxed, casual, candid conversation with them about a particular area of the independent film or television production industry. Uh, some months it'll be distribution, other months it's casting. This month we have a very special guest, uh, and uh, I'm gonna introduce them here, and hold your applause until I introduce both of them, if you could, thank you. So there's a new show on the History Channel, it's called Great Lake Warriors, uh, just pre uh, premiered this summer, and this gentleman next to me is an Illinois native, and he's one of the executive producers on it. So we're gonna be talking about taking a TV series from idea to pilot to series. And uh, I was talking to Marty a little bit before, and he said, we didn't know about this either. So it's gonna be kind of fun uh, hearing Marty talk about that journey uh, and, and how he learned from it and how he arrived at the successful uh, outcome that he did. So our uh, moderator for tonight is our Festival Advisory Council President, Mary Kay Cook. And please, warm round of applause for executive producer of Great Lake Warriors, Marty Bernstein. A long and thorough intro, thank you. Okay, so um, thank you so much for coming out and speaking with us tonight, really appreciate it. And first of all, congratulations. I mean, what a feat to get your idea to script, to pilot, to series. So um, for those of you that don't know, it plays Thursday evenings on the History yes, Channel. So congratulations again. Thank you. Um, Let's get started with the whole idea process. Like, how did you come up with the idea for Great Lakes Warrior, Great Lake Warriors? Well, it's a it's a partnership. My myself and uh, a sailing buddy for fifteen years got together with his rugby buddy for twenty years, and um, we are all writers of a sort. Uh, Jim Campbell is a published writer of, of documentary. Uh, books on, well, this first one was about New Guinea in World War II. Uh, it was called The Ghost Mountain Boys. And we still have a film in the can that we want to sell about the Ghost Mountain Boys. Uh, then he wrote another well, he wrote another one about his cousin in the Great White North in Alaska, a subsistence uh, fisherman, hunter, trapper, uh, he has raised his family there and you know never sees civilization for the most part and that's uh what's called the uh, uh wilderness it escapes me right now the name uh, of this wilderness. Is the wilderness and it's you know it's about survival in uh the alaskan wilderness and one man's story uh he his latest book is called uh the color of war it is about the black soldiers in uh, San Francisco, uh, the, the Chicago, I don't know if you know about the, the uh, uh, Port Chicago disaster when a munition ship uh, exploded uh, that was being loaded for the Saipan invasion. Uh, and you know that's what this book is about. So hopefully these projects will also make it to the screen. But what we do is we get together and somebody says, uh, hey, why don't we try this? I heard about a tugboat that's loading taconite up in Duluth and it has a, a barge attached to it and they're gonna shove down to Chicago after they load this. Let's go see what they're doing. Let's get it on film. 
And that's where the idea starts. Did you know these people on the tugboat? We knew nobody. We, we called up and we, George and Jim and I kind of have a gift of gab and get people to talk, well. agree to be on film. You know, we're gonna shoot and maybe we'll turn this into a TV series. And they go, okay, come on and you know. So we get on board and we start shooting and we start shooting. And well, that, that voyage was kind of not really interesting. We put some footage together of that, showed it to our production partners and they were, yeah, this is, this is not very interesting. It's kind of boring. Um, we need more excitement. We need more adventure. We need more character. And we went back out. And somebody told us about a tugboat operation down in Calumet City uh, called, um, uh, it was part of John Seldick's operation called Cal Fleet. And there we found character. And there we found action. And there, after two and a half years, we finally got uh, a network to fight on. So you were never particularly interested in tugboats before. No. <laughs> but they're fun. <laughs> but then they became fascinating to you. OK. So can you talk a little bit about the partnership that you have with Towers Productions and how that came about? Originally, it was just to get a job. You know, the, 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 I've been in the commercial uh, editing business for my whole career, uh, some 25 years or more. And that's a young man's business. If you want to do advertising, television commercials, unless you are top management, um, they want you young, dumb, and stupid. And so, you know, you do it and you have a good career. But the arc of a of a career for a, uh, for somebody in advertising is first five years. Um, who's Marty Burns? You're trying to make your 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 reputation. Next five years. Get me Marty Bernstein. You've started to get it. You've started to make it. Next five years, get me a younger and a cheaper Marty Bernstein. And then the next five years, who's Marty Bernstein? You know? So that's the nature of the ad business. And so when I saw that writing on the wall, I had to go back to my first love, which was documentary. I was lucky enough to partner with Jim Campbell and George Hood. And um, uh, we. so I went to, long story, I went to Towers okay. looking for a job. I, I, I needed work, and I went looking for an editing job. And I just happened to mention that we had this documentary in the can about World War II in the Guinea. Well, the CEO at the time um, was British, his, her, her, uh, and uh, his wife was from Australia and knew this story. So he was really interested. So we started pitching that, and we just couldn't sell it to a network. At all. We had had a, a modest success with it two years before and got an offer from the History Channel, uh, uh, coincidentally. And yet, they, you know, when we tried to put the deal together, we asked for just a little bit more and they walked away. Be careful what you ask for, you might not get it. Uh, so they, so we, we, we then had this idea for that, that started the relationship. And as soon as we, had the tugboat idea, they were interested. That's when we finally got some footage that was compelling. And that took two and a half years from the first time I first walked into Towers Production. It took two and a half years to finally convince them that they could sell this to a network. Um, it, you know, the, the old adage that um, it takes 30 years to be an overnight success is absolutely true. And even after that first success, Nothing is guaranteed. You have to keep working at it and, and pushing it because that's the nature of the business. So you've got this partnership. You've got these fascinating tugboat types. And you've got some great footage. You've got an in over at the History Channel. How did you sell it? And did they buy a certain number of episodes, a series? Or did they just green light the pilot? They, actually, there wasn't a pilot. As soon as they saw the footage, they fell in love with it. Um, they said, oh, we're gonna give you a green light on this for eight episodes. Uh, originally, it was supposed to start in May of this year. Uh, but they, you know, they said to the production company, um, you guys have a budget of two and a half million for eight episodes. We wanna see that, and you have carte blanche that basically accepts you have to run it by the executive producer at Network, uh, Matt Ginsburg, uh, 
vice president producer at the History Channel. So uh, that's, you know, um, you get your own crew, you get your director of photography, you get your showrunner, uh, and uh, you make the, the series and we'll uh, approve it episode by episode. And, you know, but in, to get to that point, I had to spend nine days out on the tugboats in ice, storms, snow, and, um, uh, you know, uh, some tense moments, nine days uh, around Christmas time two, two years ago in order to get the footage that convinced Hinchery Channel that this would be a, a show go. And how involved are you in the day-to-day -day production of uh, Great Lake Warriors now, or during, during the time of production? Not as much as we'd like to be. Uh, Jim and George and I basically had to deliver our um, our newborn into the hands of the surgeon and walk away and watch it being taken into the operating room. That's you know, and I went through that with my son. I know, I know how that is. You know, it's it's scary, but we had no choice. Once a network green lights uh, a show, they own it lock, stock, and barrel. They call all the shots. They approve all of the cast. They approve all of the characters, um, and and then the production company. In this case, it was Towers Productions in Chicago. Um, they hired a showrunner who was recommended by my partner Jim, and he um, recommended a great showrunner who had had some experience. Uh, from then on, it's between the showrunner and the executive producer at Network pretty much to decide how the show is going to go. Did that leave you feeling despondent in any way? Because you had invested so many years into um, you know, putting this project together, then to sort of walk away from it and not have any sort of creative influence. We did um, have a little bit of creative control, Mary Kay. We did have well, a little bit of creative. They would, aren't, I'm very glad for you. We, I mean, we, you know, they would ask us for, you know, what what do you think about this character? What do you think about this captain? You know, who should we try? Who should we work with? And we were able to advance those. But once the network uh, buys it, they they take it all over. And um, so we had to kind of step back, bite our tongues, not always have the input that we wanted. And yet, I got to tell you, the people who worked on the show, every one of them, from um, Matt Ginsburg at History to Joe Boyle, the show. Um, Melissa Woods, the uh, story uh, producer, and everybody at Towers. That Zach McFarland was the um, uh, the director of photography. He came from Deadliest Catch. He worked a couple seasons on Deadliest Catch. So these these guys were no slouch. They hired some really good cameramen, really good producers. They got some dynamite footage um, and put it together the way they saw it. And um, that's their decision. They are paying the bucks. <laughs> okay, so. What sort of doors has this opened for you in terms of future productions, and what is it that you're working on now and would like to have in the future? Once you are a player, once you have any kind of success in TV or, or the movies, in, in the business, um, they look at you as a generator of ideas, and that's all they want. I mean, content is king. Give me an idea and flesh that idea out. Tell me what's unique about this idea. Anybody can have a show about um, oh, whatever, uh, uh, storage lockers, but how people bid on storage lockers and win it away from each other and then, you know, kind of fight each other for it and the characters develop week after week. That becomes a TV show like Storage Wars. Now, most of reality TV, I not seen. What I have seen, I think, somewhat pales by comparison to Great Lake Warriors. By the way, how many here have heard of the TV show Great Lake Warriors? How many here have watched the TV show Great Lake Warriors? That's what I thought. It's really, really hard to get an audience uh, for, for a reality show or any kind of TV show because there's so much out there. So you just got to dig in there and fight. And most of our audience that's what they, what they told us. It doesn't matter if you tell your friends. It doesn't matter if you tell the Midwest Independent Film Festival about it. What matters is what was just on before 
in the previous hour or half hour. That's your fee, that's your audience fee. And if they stay with the show for the first half hour and they stay with your show for the next half hour, that's where the numbers come from. And it's all about the numbers, no matter how good it is, no matter how much you and your friends like it, it's all about the numbers. So you have a voice now, you have a in, as you say. Um, they wanna know, what are your ideas, Marty? And so what is it that you would like to do next? Um, I've got ideas that go back to when I was working on the, on the railroad when I was 21. I'd love to do a reality show about um, the, the rail yards and, and the people who work them and their characters. It's a microcosm of our society. It's just amazing. Maybe someday I'll get to do that. I want to see um, uh, uh, the, our, our reality or our documentary about um, New Guinea, uh, Ghost Mountain Boys. I want to see that go. Um, we, but we have a lot of ideas we're pitching right now to various production companies, um, and who knows where they'll go, to what network. What network will perk up their ears and say, we want this, we want to bring this to the public. Um, to me, my, my first love is documentary, and this is documentary in a way that people haven't seen it before. So we may get a second season out of Great Lake Warriors, um, if not with history, maybe with another network. We can always repitch it if they don't pick it up. But we want to, we love what we do. We're excited about it. We've got great ideas. I can't share any of them with you right now. Um, but we're, we're, we're looking to get another series on TV. Great. What would you say is the biggest lesson that you learned that you can tell our audience about? What is the biggest lesson that you learned throughout the entire process? Patience. Um, it's been, George and Jim and I got together in, in 2006 um, and, and started this process. It's now six years later, we've had our first success, our first eight episodes on TV, and it, that's what it takes. It takes uh, tremendous patience, um, overlooking your little failures, celebrating your little successes, and just keep making content. Um, realize that, that the public out there wants these ideas. You just have to find a way to bring it to them. Great, thank you. Um, at this point, I think we should open it up to questions, see what anybody has. Uh, anybody have any questions? Yes, right here. What, what, what's the show just before your show? Well, what's the show just before your show? What's your lead in? What our lead in, I think the first uh, time was either Pawn Stars or what was the other one? Um, Pawn Stars would be a good one. Ice Road Trucker. I'm not sure. I think it was Pawn Stars. Um, now you got to understand, there is a certain audience for Pawn Stars, and if they, if 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 uh, you know, they are they're listening to these guys talking about the, the the estimate or the cost or the price of a certain item. And then right after that comes these chain smoking, chain swearing, tugboat captains that are, you know, always within an inch of their lives. They might not find that interesting, even though the rest of us find it very interesting. So it, it's always grabbing the, that that previous audience and making it making it happen. Great question. Uh, yes, up there in the back. Nine days on a tugboat. How was it? Nine days on a tugboat was. Uh, exciting, boring, um, sleep deprived, great food. Those guys eat, eat really well. They they cook like crazy. We ate really well, and and frightening. I mean, when we got out onto Lake Huron after our tow broke loose in the ice at the uh, west end of Lake Erie at Delay Passage, and then which delayed us getting up the Detroit River into Lake St. Clair and the St. Clair River. When we finally got out onto Lake Huron. It was dark, and the wind had built to 50 miles an hour, and we had 12 foot seas, and we were just, we now, what happened is we were a light tug, we came from Chicago to go and tow a, a, a tug and barge combination that we're supposed to shove this load of wind turbine towers uh, from Buffalo to Menominee. The reason you can't take these wind turbine towers around the Great Lakes easily is because of 
bridges and uh, trucking regulations and such and weight on axle. And so <clears throat> they loaded 14 of these wind turbine towers on a barge. And they'd done two shoves before that. It was really successful. But this time, they, they'd had a delay. They'd had ice and storms in the Northeast where they came from in Vermont. And we had to go and rescue this tug and barge and tow it across Lake Erie, up to Lake Huron, across Lake Michigan to Menominee, where it would be offloaded onto trucks and then trucked out to um, Idaho, its eventual destination. So when we ran into that storm um, and 50 mile an hour winds, 12 foot seas on um, uh, Lake Huron, it was a little scary, especially when I got up at five o'clock in the morning because I couldn't stay in my bunk any longer and I joined the, the captain, Speedy, on the, on the, in the wheelhouse, and we both wedged ourselves in against the bulkhead like this in our captain's chairs for six hours um, because the thing was rolling so much. The, the other tug that was in the notch behind this load of the barge, they had to break out because they couldn't ride any longer. So they came around so, alongside. I got some great footage of them. My partner, George, who was on that tug, by the way, I'm glad he's not here. Um, he, he was so sick, he couldn't get up and shoot footage of us. So we got great footage of his talk, but, but he didn't get any footage of ours. Um, well, the captain, Speedy, he turned to me at one point and said, do you ever feel like killing yourself, Marnie? No. <laughs> Thank God. And I said, well, you know, I think everybody's had suicidal thoughts at some time in their life. He says, no, 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 no. He says, you know, I mean, I could, he was sick as a dog. He was sick as a dog. This is a tough book, Captain, right? He said, because I could just walk out on that bridge wing right now and throw myself overboard and it'll be over. Oh. And I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. Please um, don't do that, Captain. Please Speedy. don't do that. <laughs> yeah, like, well, it took us 12 hours. We made it through that. And once we were in the lee of Bois Blanc and, and Canada by um, Mackinac, uh, we knew we were home free. But uh, that 12 hours, that was a little bit you got to pay your dues. Yeah, sounds like it. Wow. Okay. More questions for Marty. Yes, up in the corner. Did you ever consider taking any of your projects and distributing through an internet channel? Have you thought of any um, projects going through an internet distribution model as opposed to network? network? As opposed to network. We, we, we found that um, we tried everything. We went to PBS. We went to... Um, WTTW, we went to network on our own, and we just didn't find that, you know, we'd have the kind of response, the kind of payback for our efforts that we needed in order to support ourselves, and so that's why we decided to go network. And I don't know, if, if, if it becomes lucrative, and if we find that, that internet is lucrative, we would definitely go there. Right now, we, we want to play our hand with the networks. Any questions from any audience members behind us here? Yeah. Come on back up here. Yes. Ah, sorry. Hello. So the question is, what helped you get tipped over the edge in the negotiation process with the networks? You know, that's a good question because our production partner, Towers, did most of the negotiations until there was a green light. We were not in the room. And even though our uh, entertainment attorney suggested that we be in the room, we didn't feel the confidence to uh, be in on the negotiations. Obviously, if we were now negotiating for a new show since we've been there already we would want to be in the room and then we would have some uh, say about uh, our creative input and you know what we what we expect from the show that kind of thing but at this point uh, our first time we left it in their hands they had already had success in, in, in network shows good question any others for Marty yes Could you repeat that? I can hear you. I understand that film work is a huge amount of ongoing problems, such as 
the movie that the elder Shane was in when they had this big stormy wet mess and he had a heart attack or a nervous breakdown. Was that true in your work? No, it's it's true. I understand your question. You want to know if if it's as stressful in terms of production as uh, in, in the motion picture. And I would say it's every bit as stressful, maybe even more. You never know what's going to happen out there. And these guys, you know, the production crew, the, the, the cameramen, the sound guys, uh, the producers, they're out on these boats. And, you know, the, the guys who do this, the, these tugboat operators and captains, they take their life in their hands every time they go out. I, I've been sailing um, uh, big boats on Lake Michigan for 25, 30 years, as long as I've been in production. And um, our season ends uh, October 15th. We put the boats away. That's when the tugboat season begins. And they go until it's absolutely frozen over. So they've got storms, and they've got ice, and they've got stuff, snow and rain. These guys are iron men. They are an American original. They take their lives in their hands every day. When they go out, they don't know if they're coming back. And it's not just hype on the show. They really don't. And uh, the, our, our star of the show, John Selvig, he lost his brother when he was 19. He lost his grandfather in a tugboat accident. So um, it's, um, it's not an easy job. And yes, anything can happen. Other questions for Marty? Yes, right here in the front. Absolutely. That, how, much, how much of an investment do you think is a good worthwhile investment to put up first before you start getting other people to help finance the project? So the question is about um, creating a teaser trailer mm -hmm. and uh, personal investment, I would assume financial mostly, uh, do you put in before you seek out a pr uh, production partner? When I left, uh, you know, I had my own business in commercial. Um, uh, post-production uh, for advertising and when I divested myself of my interest in that I went out and I bought a Mac Pro um, and Final Cut and decided I'm gonna set up on my own after being on my own for 25 years basically because every client you know is, is about bringing in the next buck but uh, I got together with Jim and George and that was my investment Jim, uh, George bought a camera. They all put in, we all had skin in the game one way or another, whether it was a modest financial investment for a camera or a, or a computer uh, or ideas or whatever. We all put some skin in the game. And so, but what, you, what we found, and this was basically empirical, we had to learn by doing. We had to reinvent the wheel. We didn't know how, what, what the process was. And so we made trailers, and we made trailers, and we made trailers, and we made trailers, until finally, you know, the production company said, this, this can go, we're taking it to network. And the network looked at it and said, this can go, we're taking it to series. And it's basically trial and error. You never know what they're gonna like, and whether it's, and then, even when they like it, and they put two and a half million behind it, and maybe the production company puts, you know, 20% more on that, you still don't know if the public is going to like it. And that's where the rubber meets the road. Is the public going to like it? Are you going to get to a second season? And when do you find that out? Because you're, you're pretty well into this first you know, season. Next week is the last, is the last uh, uh, episode. We still don't know. We thought we would know in the first couple of weeks. And when it didn't go and they moved it from 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock, we realized that the public may not love this, you know, the way they love storage wars. Who knew? But, you know, you've got to keep on going. If they want more ideas from us, we'll pitch more ideas. We may repurpose this and make it a, a, a different show about tugboats on the Great Lakes um, than the one History Channel bought. Um, we, we definitely have that right if they pass on a second season. Um, it's exciting to be in the game and know that you know, they are confident in your ability, they're confident in your ideas, they want to hear more from you. That's the best part of it. Yes, right here. I'm curious about the trailers you speak of. Do you tailor them like a sizzle reel for specific production people or as opposed to a wide audience? Uh, 
um, it's really a sizzle reel. They want, they want to see in two to three minutes what, uh, what's the most exciting, compelling aspect. They want to see characters. They want to see action. Um, they want to see storylines. You know, whatever you've got, you could show them. Um, they'll sit up and take notice. That's that. Yeah, basically, it's a sizzle. You do, but it, it, since uh, Towers Productions is already known to these principals at the networks, they walk into uh, to a. Uh, there's a festival every year in Washington D.C. called Real Screen. They walk into Real Screen. Sometimes they present there. More often than not, they'll just go to New York. They'll sit down. They'll play the trailer. They'll give them the treatment and the, the uh, what's called the conceit and uh, about what how the show will be structured. And, and from there, you know, the exec uh, will say, uh, this sounds interesting, give me more. And, and you know, after you, if you give them a little bit more, they'll say, okay, let's do this. That's what you want to hear. Let's do this. So it literally happens that fast in one meeting. It does. It, we, generally, it, it won't happen in that meeting, but there will be so much interest generated there that the producer you've met with, the exec producer, vice president of the network or whatever, will take it to the rest of his team and uh, her team and show it and say, I think we've got something here. What do you think? Should we give it a green light? And you know, then it's all in the cards. Yeah. Oh, follow up. Follow up. How did you go about reaching those network people? How did you get that That was that was Towers Productions. Since they had been, you know, a player in Chicago and done, uh, you know, criminal justice and all these uh, gang wars and all these other television series, they were well known to the networks in New York. And once you are well, are known enough to get in the room and pitch an idea, they'll listen to what you have. They may not like it, uh, but they'll listen. And you know, if they do, then ne the next step is let's flesh this out. Let's put a budget behind it. Let's hire a uh, crew. Let's get the cast together. Um, we want to see some casting reels. We want to, you know, uh, find out, you know, how this is going to play out. And so we got four tugboat companies from Sturgeon Bay, Chicago, Duluth, and um, uh, Thunder Bay, Ontario, and we were all set to go with four more or eight more tugboat companies next season. So far, so far, that is not the reality, but it could be. That's a really, really good question. You cannot predict what the audience will buy. You can't do it in the movies. You can't do it in TV, um, whether it's daytime or, or prime time. Never, you've never been able to predict what the audience is going to buy. Um, so, will they will they stick with reality TV, or, or will there be a reality TV fatigue? That's a, I don't know. I wish I did, and I wish I knew what would what the next hot idea was. But I love documentary. It's my first love. Uh, I worked in advertising for 25 years because that's where the money was. But I absolutely love documentary. I love our ideas and what we can pitch. And I think as, as long as you have a compelling idea, whether it's reality TV or pure documentary or um, dramatic or feature film, I, I, it doesn't matter. It, as long as you have an idea that people want to watch, they're going to buy it and they're going to watch it. Yes. So how would you define, like, what would you try to put in a documentary that you wouldn't put in a reality? So you in know, the trailer yeah. that you're, you're pitching, what would you put in a documentary that you wouldn't put in reality, or, in a reality pitch? Or, or uh, overall, what would we put in a, do, a, a reality show that we wouldn't put in documentary or vice versa? Yes? yes. That's the question. OK. That's, a, that's, that's also a very good question. Um, Reality TV, as I experience this, become very formulaic and almost boring. But you know that's the way they put it together. You got to have a cliffhanger every, you know, ten minutes before the commercial break, um, and come back on that cliffhanger. And whether that's manufactured or it's real, you've got to have a, um, you know, you, you you've got to have 
a new shot every three seconds. Um, it's, it's become so formulaic that it's almost intolerable, and yet that's what, you know, this short attention span, it's the, um, what's that, like, People Magazine of, of the airwaves, you know. Uh, make it, keep it short, keep it sweet, keep it sound white, and move on, and keep people tuned in and get them to the next program an hour from now. That's, that's really the, you know, what would I put in reality TV that I wouldn't put, put in documentary? I'd make it move, but I think the most important thing in either genre is character. And I don't know if we had enough character in the first half, uh, half of, of Great Lake Warriors, and that may be why the audience didn't buy it uh, right away. But who knows? They may. Any last questions for Marty before we wrap up? You guys have a question back here? No. Ah, here we go. Last one, yes. Just a little louder, please. Adding drama to the documentary. Drama. How do you add drama to your documentary? To add drama. Right. Well, I mean, and basically, that's what the audience wants. They want character. They want drama. They want character and drama. Those are the two most important aspects of it. Um, how do you maintain that when, you know, what we ran into when when we started shooting, and we we didn't start shooting until almost November. We had a whole October of vicious um, winds and waves and storms on the Great Lakes that we didn't get to shoot. And then it turned into a really mild winter. That's not what you want to show. There's no drama in a mild winter, you know? So, you know, we had to slug through that. In fact, I watched an episode last night. Uh, it's called Friday the 13th. A lot of the footage that we had shot two years before that, and it was in archive, made it into that show because that's where the ice was. Because it was such a mild winter, we didn't have ice this year on the Great Lakes not to the point where we'd had it two years before. So whatever it takes, make it dramatic. Yes. Question. Uh -huh. I've heard the name of the show. It doesn't mean anything to me. It doesn't describe anything to me. Pitch it to me in three seconds. Well, I can tell you this. The first title that we had for the show was my idea, and we called it Tug Job. No, no. <laughs> well, and obviously the network didn't go for that. They tried all kinds of different titles. They you have know? no idea why. That's Great so Lake weird. Talk, so whatever. But it never, you know, it never had the magic that I thought. That it touched it. But they would go for that. So, um, but that would have been my pitch, you know. Here, these are men of iron out on uh, the, the, the greatest, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, 20,000 square miles or whatever uh, of inland ocean. It's not a lake, it's not a mill pond. It's an inland ocean and it has all of the hazards of an ocean. And these guys um, go out every day not knowing if they will come back alive and yet they have a job to do. And we all know that we all have a job to do. Watch theirs. What is their job? Oh, they are hauling thousands and thousands of tons of uh, machinery, material, uh, all over the Great Lakes uh, to keep this vast inland uh, waterway uh, of commerce open so that we have our materials. We have our materials for steel um, and, and grain that has to get to market, uh, coal that has to get to a power plant. Uh, nobody sees what they do. They see a tugboat in the harbor, they think, oh, isn't that cute? I could have one of those in my bathroom. <laughs> so they're really an essential part of American commerce. Absolutely. More than we know. More than we know. Great. <laughs> all right. Please join me in thanking Marty for sharing all of his stories with us. Thank you, Marty.